you make your way to your seat, please? We're going to have a break after the guest speaker. Just do it. Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome to our November meeting. Um, today we have a really good speaker. About seven years ago, I was scrolling through eBay, and I was looking at shells. And I came across some awesome lion's paws and thorny oysters, and they were local shells. So I uh, looked up who this location of the seller, and it was a local diver named Adam Wilson. I messaged him, and he said that I was more than welcome to come to his home and look at his collection, which I did. Little did he know that it was going to turn into many more visits. <laughs> but Adam has collected shells most of his life. He became scuba certified in 2003. I'm thrilled that he's here today to share his uh, underwater adventures. Come on up, Adam. You can have your hands full. Do I have to hold it down or can I no, just roll? No, not anymore. It's free. Okay. <laughs> really? could, yeah. I don't want to be behind that because I can't see my pictures. You don't have to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Is that decent? Okay. So first of all, th thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks for having me. This is a, a very big honor and privilege for me, so thank you. And I'd like to start off by <clears throat> giving you some, some history about myself and my family. Uh, my grandparents began vacationing in Florida not too long after World War II. No, I, I, I got this. So... That's, it. That's okay, I got this. And the story she told me about finding bucketfuls of shells, and it, it really it really intrigued me, and it turned into family vacations. I, I remember as a young, young boy, my family would come to Sanibel Island, and we would stay sometimes with my grandparents and vacation together. And it was always so exciting as a, a young boy to get waken up in the middle of the night to grab my flashlight and, and go walk on the beach at two o'clock in the morning because the tide was low. This was, this was crazy. I never got to do this at home. And it was so much fun. And it was also that thrill of whatever you found on the beach was yours. You could take that home with you. What a, what a thrilling prospect that was. And whether it was that or whether it was renting a boat to go search for king's crowns in the backwater or wading through uh, the waters at Ding Darling National Park, whether it was uh, picnicking on Upper Captiva Island, just all those adventures from family vacations really started my, my love affair with seashells. And in 1990, my family moved to Port Charlotte. And my grandmother and I would spend a lot of time. We would walk uh, Ski Alley or Stump Pass. Uh, I would wade Ski Alley, and she would walk the beach. And we would meet at the pass, and we would share what, what we found. She would find her typical beach specimens, and I would find bumpless wonder horse conchs, big lightning whelks, tulips at the time, the turtle grass, and Ski Alley was knee deep in summer, and the shells you could find there were unbelievable. And I just, I never forget those days. And I would, as a young man in the early 90s, before I was scuba certified, I would spend uh, every trip to my grandmother's house in Port Charlotte, I would paw through her shell cabinet and I would just awe at the magnificent specimens that she had, that she had found throughout her life. And I would wonder to myself, you know, will I ever find anything as amazing as she has ever found? I, I, I don't know, I don't think I will, because I hadn't. And I, I remember days on days and hours on hours going through her shell cabinet. It must have been 200 times looking at all the things that she had in there. 
Yeah. <laughs> and in 2003, I became scuba certified, and that's when I started looking for. Uh, well, let me let me advance here. I think one picture didn't work. Uh, yep, that's correct. I'm gonna back up. Okay, we're gonna keep going. So. There's a, there's a picture that Meredith informed me would not work, and it's okay. <laughs> because every time I head offshore, and I'm staring to the east, and I see the sunrise, and I think of a song, you probably all know it, it's from a band called America. <laughs> and it's called A Horse With No Name. <laughs> and there's a line in that song, and it says, the ocean is a desert, with its life underground and the perfect disguise above. Every time I head offshore, I think of that song because it's just so true. There's so much out there that no one has ever seen before and I just want to see it all. And it's just not possible in a lifetime. So we do what we can do. This is, this is a photograph of a shipwreck called the Bayronto. And we're gonna go through a few of these before my next section. And when I first got scuba certified, I began spear fishing because I was an avid fisherman. So it was the next logical step to, to spear fish. That's, that is a file clam on some hard coral on the Bay Ronto. And I, I became quite good at spear fishing. And over the course of a decade, I, I became very proficient killed a lot of fish. I know how to fill a boat. And, and it, it got to a point where I would find shells on occasion, but not very often. They had to really stick out like a sore thumb. And I feel like I'm missing some photos here. So we're just going to keep going forward. This is another shot from the Bay Ronto. This gives you a, a, a this gives you an idea of the size of, this is actually the bottom of the ship. She's upside down. She's 400 feet long by 50 feet wide. And although this looks like maybe it's a ledge or just some live bottom, it's actually the bottom of a shipwreck. So I became very proficient at killing fish in the Gulf of Mexico. And it became like a job to me. It lost its thrill. It lost its fun. I'd spend all day Sunday cleaning fish, giving people fish so that they could put it in the freezer and never appreciate it. And that's when I decided to put, put the spear gun down and really focus on just looking around and maybe seeing if I had been missing something all this time. And it turns out I had. I had been missing a lot. Because as you know, what do you find? You find what you're looking for. And speaking with Marilyn earlier, she is the Wintel Trap Queen, she said. And, and, and I know how that is because your eye becomes tuned to, to finding specific species. And when I put the gun down, I began to find more shells. And it, and it became more exciting because now, because now I had to revisit every dive site I had ever been to and start looking for shells and not just fish. This is a shot of a damselfish over some fire coral on the Bay Ronto. Okay. This is another shot of the Bay Ronto. Just to give you an idea of the, of the life that this shipwreck holds, you can see here blue runners, barracudas, mangrove snappers. It is just a plethora of life from a ship that's been on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico for a hundred years. You can, you, can, you can clearly see the keel of the ship. That's the keel right there. There's a nurse shark in the background, and behind that, a school of bait. Of course, a sea turtle in the foreground. This is a shot of the stern. You can see the rudder post, and you can see the prop hub where the propeller used to be. We'll come back to that in a little bit. This is a shot inside the Bay Ronto. She was a freighter uh, carrying 7,000 tons of wheat from Galveston, Texas to Mar Marseille, France before she sank. So the inside of the ship is very similar to like a large cavern. There's, there's no entanglement hazards. There's no hallways. It's a very large open tube. And you can swim through the entire ship. 
And I don't know if you can see it or not, but that is what a lion's claw looks like when you find it alive. Now that's an orange one, so it's kind of obvious, but you can also see that they're also very camouflaged. And if you aren't looking directly at it, it would be very easy to pass that and not even know it was there. This is a shot of the same shipwreck as the Bay Ronto. She is broken in half at midships. And just to, the, just to the stern, which is this way, is the boiler room. This is forward. That's a large school of, of white grunts in the center. It just gives you an idea of what a shipwreck looks like on the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico after 100 years. It's a lot of twisted steel, and it's a lot of growth. And this is a picture from the, the stern of the Bay Aranto. And again, just showing you how twisted and broken uh, the shipwreck really is. And there's just so many places to look. When you consider this being 400 feet long, 50 feet wide, you could dive on this wreck for your entire life and never see every nook and cranny. This gives some reference. It's a good friend of mine that lives here in Inglewood. His name's Eric Pinkham, works at Riverwood Golf Club. And this is also at the midship break. You told me that one wouldn't play. I'm gonna hit, a, I'm gonna have to hit. Escape. Escape. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm getting older. <laughs> so, Do you need me to I got it. Okay. Escape and go forward and hit go. This is, thank you. This, this is in the boiler room of the Bay Ronto. That's a Goliath grouper. It's probably two or three hundred pounds. You can actually see the hook in his mouth right here and a long piece of monofilament leader hanging from his mouth. It doesn't really seem to disturb them. Those hooks rust out eventually and uh, does not seem to slow them down at all. So once I put once I put the spear gun down, I started look I started looking around. I, I'm sure you can see this is a lion's paw, and you can also see just how well camouflaged they really are when you find them alive on the bottom. And this is one of the very first ones I found, and I remember thinking to myself, this must be my lucky day. I found a live lion's paw. I've been diving for years and years and years. What, what a day! But what I didn't realize was I had not been looking for lion's paws. I've been looking for fish. And you find what you're looking for. So I found another lion's paw on, this, on the same day. And I found another lion's paw on the same day. And, and this continued until I finally realized what I had been missing. Uh, I had been missing a, a lot of stuff that was right in front of my eyes. And I, and I just needed to look. So it was very exciting for me because this, this basically, all the, all the places I had ever dived in the Gulf of Mexico, I had to go dive again, because what was there that I didn't see? So there's, of course there's one in a clean condition, and that's not what they look like when we find them, obviously. Okay, this is a picture of the Bay Ronto. This, this is a, this is a this picture was not known until a few years ago. There were, there were virtually no known pictures of the Bay Ronto until a few years ago. Uh, a close friend of mine named Jim Joseph owned a dive shop in Port Charlotte named Fantasy Scuba. And he was contacted by a man from England named Trevor Saunders. And Trevor wanted to, to learn to become scuba certified. He wanted to come to America and he wanted to dive on the Bay Ronto. And my buddy Jim said, well, that's, that's great. I can take you there. Uh, I advertised that trip on my website. But why are you coming from England to dive on the Bay Ronto? And Trevor explained to my buddy Jim that his grandfather had recently passed away. And they went into his attic. And they found a chest. And inside that chest were photos and telegrams that he had never told anyone about. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those photographs. This is from Galveston Bay. And Trevor Saunders' grandfather had been on the Bay Ronto 
when it sank, oh. and he had never told anyone. Uh, there were 48 people on the Bay Ronto when she went down in 1919. It was a powerful hurricane. It was the most, it was the most powerful hurricane to ever hit Key West at the time. And all 48 people aboard survived, which is amazing because a lot of ships didn't make it. One, one case being uh, there was a luxury cruise liner from Spain called the Valbanera. And she was making way from Spain to Havana, Cuba. And the last radio signal received from the Valbanera was, the storm is too strong, we can't make for port. We must ride out at sea. All 488 people were lost, and the Valbanera has never been found. And that's one of, one of many ships that were never found from the hurricane of 1919. There's another picture of the Bay Ronto. You, you can see the name is actually, this is, this is an older photo that was recovered from Trevor Grand, Trevor's grandfather's chest. And this was before the ship was renamed the Bay Ronto. This was her original name, the Tronto. <laughs> and also, e excellent photo. The ship's in a little better condition. And this photo compared to this yeah. photo. Yeah. This one looks like a pretty old scowl. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is a porthole that was recovered from the Bay Ronto by my good friend Jim Joseph. Uh, most of the easily recoverable, recoverable portholes have been. I'm sure there's still some there, but they would require, require some digging. And yes, that's very heavy. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, in the earlier picture, you notice there was no propeller on the Bay Ronto. Well, that's kind of odd. Uh, I have a good friend named Al Barefoot, lives in Sarasota, and Al's dad was a diver back in the 70s, and him and his buddies decided they were gonna take a shrimp boat out to the Bay Ronto, and they were going to recover the prop for the scrap value, because most props were made of bronze. And, and they did so. They, they went out to the Bay Ronto, they recovered the brass letters from the bow, they recovered the port, the port of origin from the stern letters, and they recovered the prop, wow. only to discover that the prop was pot metal. Oh. It's completely worthless. So it's it sat in a it sat in a Sarasota scrapyard for years. The final resting place is unknown. I'm assuming it wound up in a landfill, or or who who, who only knows? It was a futile effort. But uh, to think about the fact that they did that in the 70s with the gear and the gases that were available to them at the time is a pretty impressive feat. Okay. So that's when my, that's when my shell affair... It escaped. It escaped. That's, yeah, I'm on it. <laughs> I know the it. So really that... Will, will it play? I think so. Let me go back. Yeah. So that's when my shell affair was rekindled. Uh, these, this is a, this is a nice example of what can be found on the Bay Ronto. Of course, uh, Great Eastern Murex, and Tritons trumpets, hairy Tritons, spiny oysters, uh, Cypraea cervus, the lion's paws, and the, uh, a lot of shells from the Bay Ronto have an or have an orange or red hue, like the tulip. Uh, a lot of the shells from this wreck will take on the, the iron from the steel and will incorporate that into the shell themselves. I think Martha has a deer cowrie that's more red right. from that wreck. Another quick thing that's super cool about the Bay Ronto is most of the deer cowries I find there are very small. They're miniatures. It's not unusual to find a mature deer cowrie this size, this is not a baby, this is a full grown deer cowrie, and it's the only location in the Gulf of Mexico I find tiny deer cowries that are full grown. Because of course, typically when they're full grown, they're, they're, they're much larger. But as you all know, size does not indicate maturity in mollusks, necessarily. Yeah, yeah. here's a few more. Few more shells, coarse lace murexes, 
and Atlantic tritons. We find a lot of Atlantic species in the Gulf of Mexico and in the deeper water. All right, so once I put the spear gun down, I began shelling more often. And this is the result of looking around and, and, and specifically looking for mollusks. And I eat, all, I eat all of those mostly, the oysters, lion's paws, the horse conks, uh, they're, they're quite delicious. So I'm gonna go on to a new section here. Shipwrecks aren't the only thing in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a, it's a lot of sand. You know, it's mostly sand. It's 99% sand. But there's also limestone ledges. And this is a very good example of a limestone ledge. So it will be sand on the high side. It will be sand on the low side. It'll be a rocky outcropping with a deep undercut. This is what holds life in the Gulf of Mexico. This is where you're going to find sh shells. This is where you're gonna find fish. This is where you're gonna find soft corals. This is where life exists. And this is why most people don't really dive the Gulf of Mexico. It's not an exotic coral reef. It's not as beautiful as what the Keys used to look like. Uh, but to me, it's fascinating, because when you find these small pockets, uh, a lot of them have probably never been seen by human eyes. And to me, they're fascinating, because you can find life as, from as small as cleaner shrimp and nudibranchs to 100-pound black groupers. This is another, exa another example of what we call live bottom. Uh, obviously, it's a spiny lobster. We do have spiny lobsters in the Gulf of Mexico. And when we, when we do find them, they are, we keep them if it's seasoned, because when you do find spiny lobsters in the Gulf of Mexico, they, are, they do not need to be measured. They are typically on, a, on a, a pretty good size. Actually, if you look back here, you can see a scamp grouper. And uh, that's kind of cool, because that's the prize, the grouper fishery. And I, I probably uh, wanted to shoot that fish. But <laughs> didn't have the with me. This, now, this is a little bit shallower. This is probably 60 or 70 feet of water. And as you can see, this is a, this is a Goliath grouper. He's tucked up under a ledge. And it just goes, this photo really goes to show you just how well camouflaged these fish are underwater. <laughs> when you pull them out of the water, they look so, so alien-like. But when you see them in their natural habitat, you go, oh my gosh, that makes perfect sense. They blend in so well. And they won't move. They will, they, will, they will stay right there. You can literally grab them by the mouth and pull them out of the way. Uh, they, do not, they do not like to move. And when you do try to move them, they make a very deep drum sound, and, uh, like, like a bass tone, and you can feel it in your whole body. Uh, another example, this is what we call Swiss cheese bottom. It's, an, it's another example of bottom we find in the Gulf of Mexico. It's just a limestone ledge where the seawater has eroded solution tubes into the ledge, creating all those small holes, it resembles Swiss cheese, and things love to live in there. Shells and fish. <clears throat> this, is, this is called South Pocket Ledge. It's in 60 feet of water. It's about 15 miles due west of Little Gasparilla Pass. Most of these photos have very good visibility. Everything I'm showing you folks today is from what we call very good visibility. Typically the visibility in the Gulf of Mexico, not so great usually 10 to 20 feet. But every once in a while, it's amazing. The visibility, and this is, this is the hopper cars at Charlie's Reef. This is 90 feet of water. You can clearly see two, two divers. There's one here, there's one here. You see the bubbles coming up. The visibility is probably in the 60 to 70 foot range. It doesn't happen often. When it does, I like to take pictures. Because when the visibility is this good, the spearfishing is usually not. 
and these days don't happen very often. If any of you fish in the Gulf of Mexico, you're probably familiar with Charlie's Reef. It's about 30 miles from Boca Grande Pass. This, this is another example of hard bottom. That's a red grouper. This is where they love to live. This is their habitat. And if, if you find a hole in the Gulf of Mexico the size of a five gallon bucket, you will find a red grouper. <laughs> that's, that's where they live. I'm using, a, I'm using my flashlight in this photo. That's why I have some, some good color. Mm -hmm. Typically at this depth, everything is more green and gray. This is, this is also the hopper cars at Charlie's Reef. Uh, this is a bull shark and a school of amberjack in the foreground. Yes, there's lots of sharks out there. No, they typically really don't bother us. Uh, even spear fishing. I have thousands of spear fishing dives under my belt with hundreds of pounds of fish on a steel stringer attached to me bleeding. And fortunately, sharks, uh, they know that we are not their normal prey. We make a lot of noise underwater with the breathing and the bubbles, and they typically give us a lot of leeway, fortunately. This is another example of a ledge. This is uh, uh, in, in 70 feet of water due west of Englewood. And this is one of my favorite ledges for finding deer calories. Uh, yeah, I, they're, they're, they tend to congregate here. Of course, they're nocturnal, so in the daytime, you have to really search up underneath the undercut to find them hiding. Other structure out in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, besides artificial reefs, natural bottom, are shrimp boats. This is a shrimp boat in 115 feet of water. Uh, shrimp boats don't fare well. They're not typically built, built incredibly well. They're fiberglass these days, and the fiberglass breaks down and is washed away quickly. Usually, the only thing left from a shrimp boat is the engine and the rigging. But even that's enough to hold life in the Gulf of Mexico. It really just doesn't take much. This is a rock that we found near the Fort Myers boxcars. And to me, it looks like an animal. That's why I took a picture of it. Some say white-tailed deer. Some say kangaroo. I just kind of think it's cool. <laughs> So when, when you start looking more closely at these ledges and these hard bottom live areas, this is what you begin to see. This is a sea anemone, and if you look close on the one tentacle, you can see a cleaner shrimp. I'm not the best photographer. I strictly use a point and shoot camera. I don't have a, a fancy camera system. Uh, I, have a, I have a very small camera I keep clipped to myself just in case I see something cool or there's no fish. <laughs> so, and, uh, I'm, I'm using my light in this scenario, and you can see the, clearly see the cleaner shrimp on the anemone. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's really cool to just slow down and hang on to a rock and just watch the tentacles wave and the cleaner shrimp do his thing. It's, it's pretty amazing. Here's, here's a live service. What I probably did was pull him out of a hole, because this is daytime, and I set him on top of the ledge and just waited. And so, of course, his mantle came out. You're looking at his anterior end, and he's working his way back into a hole. He's probably not too happy about being pulled out. This is what they look like when you find them in the daytime. This is one of those Swiss cheese holes I was talking about. And that's how you will find deer calories. They will be nestled in there, sometimes together, typically with their mantle inside the animal. And it's, I'm not gonna lie, it's really cool when you look in a hole and, and you see that. Of course, that's, uh, hel helmet shells are quite common, Gulf Mexico, Cassis madagascarensis. Find them typically in shallow water, 50 to 60 feet on live bottom, and they're a nightmare to clean. It's very difficult getting the animal outside of the, out of the shell. Uh, I, I rarely keep them anymore. 
This is a lace murex, of course, something you will find on the beach, but in deep water, they're much more frilly. And they're also uh, difficult to clean without breaking off the siphonal canal and the frills, but they're a pretty common find. It's about 100 feet of water, I believe on the Bay of Ronto. Uh, lionfish are here now. Uh, we didn't have them 10 years ago, but they're here to stay. We shoot them whenever we can because they are invasive and fortunately they are delicious. So we, we shoot them, we eat them, but they, they are in a lot of locations and in deeper water, they are everywhere. We have some areas we dive like in 200 feet of water and they cover the entire area. There's, there's no, there, there is no getting rid of them. They are here. This is an interesting shot, and at first glance, it's kind of hard to tell exactly what it is, and you might have to look at it for a minute to kind of figure out. I will, I will give you a hint. That is an eyeball right there, and that's a sucker. These are suckers over here. It's, a, it's an octopus in a hole. He has squeezed himself into a, into a hole. This is a shot of a uh, Goliath grouper under a ledge, hide, hiding out. You can see his eyeball looking at me. His mouth is towards the left of the, of the photo. He, feel, he feels very safe there, and that's why he's hanging out. And this is about in 90 feet of water, and of course the colors are so nice because I'm using a, I'm using a very high-powered light. Otherwise, the photo would be very green and gray. Uh, up, same as this photo right here. This is a sponge in 90 feet of water, and without a light, it would look green. Uh, red, orange, and yellow are filtered out of the, of the visible spectrum within about 15 or 20 feet. They're just gone. So every, everything on the bottom is green, gray, drab, dreary. Even when you shoot a fish, if you shoot a fish at 100 feet of water, the blood comes out and it is green. It is dark green and it's, and it's shocking the first time you see it. Okay, this is, this, is a, this is a very small fish called a blenny and he's in a small tiny Swiss cheese tube hole. He's probably three inches long. They're very skittish, very nervous. I sat at this hole waiting for him to poke his head out for quite some time. So I hope you appreciate it. <laughs> this is another lace murex. This just kind of, kind of goes to show you how well camouflaged they can be uh, on the bottom. If you are not looking for that silhouette, if you're not looking for that shape, it's very difficult to see. This, this was a helmet shell that was lodged in between two rocks on a ledge. And, and it was quite stuck. I do not believe this shell would have made it. And I find large shells on a regular basis in this condition dead, where they became trapped between a couple rocks. Horse conks, lightning whelks, uh, the helmet shells. And I, I did keep that one. <laughs> no, another shot of a deer cowrie, of course and some damselfish. Okay, moving on to artificial reefs. This is the USS Mohawk. She was sank in July of 2012 out at Charlie's Reef, about 30 miles from Boca Grand Pass. And to me, what's so interesting about this particular artificial reef is that it gave me an opportunity to witness the growth cycle of a lot of shells because from day one, we got to see what grew here. So some, some pictures got mixed up. This is, that's, this is a giant eastern murex from another shipwreck. This is, this is the Mohawk shortly after sinking. You can see the difference between this and the Bay Ronto from earlier that's been underwater for a hundred years. You know, th this still has clean steel showing. And there is a, there's a live lion's paw. 
some photos somehow got mixed up, but we're gonna we're gonna power through this. <laughs> another shot of there's another shot of the mohawk. That's a that's actually a pretty nice grouper right there. Yeah, I I, I uh, did not get to shoot that one, but I got his picture. So, <laughs> oh, it's going a little quick for me. This is this is the engine room of the Mohawk. This is, this is a few years after she was sunk. You can see the growth beginning to take over. Uh, there's no more clean steel now. And, and she broke apart quite badly. It did not take long for this wreck to fall apart. They used a, a large amount of TNT to blow it up and did a lot of structural damage. So at, at today, the Mohawk is just a, a rubble pile. But when she was first sank, you could swim through the entire ship. And I'm hope, here we go. So I was talking about growth cycles, and this is what I'm talking about. This is a very young lion's paw. This is a very young thorny oyster. And of course, you can see some other bivalves. This is in, this is in an, an interior room uh, of the Mohawk. And it was neat to watch these shells grow. Because unlike, because unlike horse conchs or whelks, where you can count rings on an operculum, these shells, I really had no idea how old they were when I found them. And this was the perfect time to find that out. And it definitely takes longer than I expected. That lion's paw was only about two inches, and I, I left it to watch it grow. Fortunately for me, no one else was seemed to be harvesting at this location. So I could watch these shells grow over the course of years. Lion's paws can move, of course, uh, but I, it seems like once they find a happy home, they don't. They will attach their abyssal strand and they'll stay in one spot. This is another juvenile uh, lion's paw that I monitored at the, at the Mohawk site. And, and another, and I let them grow for about four to five years before I began harvest there. That's when they started to take on a, a mature size and thickness. I'm going to move on to some actual shipwrecks because, to me, they're the most fascinating. Artificial artificial reefs are neat. I like finding shells and shooting fish. But real shipwrecks and the real history is, is where it's at for me. This is a shot of the Fantastico. This is the wheelhouse. She still has heavy lines floating from the wheelhouse. Of course, the school at Amberjack in the foreground. And she went down in 1992, I think. Let me check my notes to make sure. I'm sorry, 90, March of 93. If you were here in 93, you remember the no-name storm, uh, 80 mile an hour winds, 30 foot seas. No-name storm because it was March, it wasn't hurricane season. Ships all across the Gulf of Mexico, the Florida Straits were, were calling Coast Guard for assistance. A lot of ships sank, as was the case with the Fantastico. She was hauling fertilizer from Miami to Tampa when she went down. And the, coast, the first Coast Guard crew uh, the Jayhawk helicopter that showed up couldn't rescue anyone. The survivors were afraid to let go of the lifeboats and they wouldn't reach for the basket. Oh. The, the rescue swimmer was too tired from previous rescue attempts to go in the water to help them. They ran low on fuel and they had to leave. The second Jayhawk crew that showed up rescued three survivors, found three bodies, and four people were never rescued. She's in about 115 feet of water, about 45 miles west of Boca Grand Pass, uh, and, and holds a lot of spiny, thorny oysters and lion's paws. This, this is a lion's paw on the Fantastico, and you can see just how well they camouflage themselves. It's almost it's almost unnoticeable with the red sponge growing across it. You really have to be looking, and what really what really clues you in is the radial ribs, and that's kind of that's kind of what makes your eye catch attention if if you're looking. This is a shot of the crow's nest from the Fantastico and a, and a school of mangrove snapper. 
kind of becomes a pretty shot. Oops, let's go back. These are nurse sharks on the wheelhouse of the Fantastico. Uh, late every summer, nurse sharks will congregate for mating, usually, uh, usually the full moon in July, and they turn stark white, and shipwrecks will be covered with them. You will see hundreds of white, pure white nurse sharks. Those, those specimens are probably anywhere from 10 to 12 feet long. And they only, they only, the females only mate every two years. That's their gest gestation cycle. So you'll never see the same female two years in a row. But it's just so, it's so fascinating to see a shipwreck covered with white sharks. And it's, and it's not something a lot of people have seen. Uh, they're also they're they're also spawning grounds for Goliath grouper. It's not unusual to see a hundred or 150 Goliath grouper on a shipwreck in 100 feet of water. They're absolutely everywhere, especially mid midsummer, just like the nurse sharks. And obviously, they're not aggressive. They're not afraid of people. The average size of these fish in this particular photograph is probably seven to eight hundred pounds, and some are probably pushing a thousand pounds. Yeah, they're, they're very large animals. This is a shipwreck 62 miles from Naples called the Baja California. These are live thorny oysters. And you can see one here, and you can see one here. You can, the most easily recognizable feature is their fleshy mantle. It's black and white. It's very obvious because the shells are super covered up with growth. Very hard to see. When they close, they're almost impossible to see. The Baja California is a very interesting shipwreck. This, this is a lion's paw. And I, I like these photos so much be, just because it just shows how hard it is to see and, and how, there, here's a lion's paw right here. And it's just, it's, I, I have trained a couple of buddies to look for, to look for shells, because as you know, most, all of my friends have no idea what shells are. They shoot fish, <laughs> that's all they do. A couple of them are interested, so I've shown a few people, hey, this is what you look for. And they will, I, I have one young man that lives here in Inglewood named Paul Wagonsale and he will follow behind me. And I think I'm doing great and I'll find a, a bag full and he'll be right behind me finding just as many. <laughs> so I know I miss a lot when I'm down there. It's just, it's hard not to. Uh, the Baja California, she was sunk by the German U-boat number 84 in July of 1942, 62 miles off of Naples. Uh, this, is, this is a shot of the Baja California. She was 200 feet long and carrying general cargo from New Orleans to Guatemala and was sunk by a German U-boat. Uh, there's lots of cool things to find there. A lot of glassware. You can take a peek here. This is a Max Factor cold cream jar from 1942. <laughs> this is, a, this is a, some type of medicine bottle from 42 with a glass stopper. I found that there. Uh, Mar Martha has, I, I think she, she didn't bring it. She has. I thought you were bringing yours. I thought you were bringing yours. <laughs> she has, she has a, a uh, thorny, thorny oyster attached to a plastic barber comb. Oh. It grew on a barber's comb because uh, the ship was carrying a whole bunch of barber combs and they're all over the place. Interesting, uh, another interesting fact, the, U, the U-84 that sank the Baja California was eventually sunk in the North Atlantic in 1943 by a B-24 American Liberator. All hands were lost. This is a very interesting shipwreck that I've dived on. It's the Araby Maid, and she was built in the 1860s. She's a, she's a sailing cargo ship. She's what they call a bark which is a wooden sailboat that was ironclad. And she was a true freighter. She carried freight around the world. Mm -hmm. 
and she sailed up until 1903 uh, as such, which is pretty unusual. Uh, she was basically the last of her kind. That was, that was one, of the, one of the very last sailing cargo ships. And ironically enough, she was sunk by the SS Denver, a steamship that plowed into her port side in 1903, just north of the Dry Tortugas. And it's very obvious in this photograph you can still see the V notch in the side of the shipwreck that sank her. And a lot, lot of big fish, not very many mollusks. She's in about 215 feet of water. And once we get past about 150 feet, you really stop seeing a lot of mollusks. You still get some bivalves, some clams and oysters, but you stop seeing the thorny oysters and the deer cowries, the tulips, horse conks, all those types of shells. Fascinating ship, whole lot of big fish. This is closer to home. This is the Pegasus at Charlie's Reef. And I, I thought this shot was nice just because the visibility was good enough. You could see the entire 90 foot tugboat in, in one shot. And I do find a lot of nice shells at this site. Uh, hairy, hairy tritons, uh, 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 lion's paws. This is a shot of the bow of the Pegasus. And very typical Gulf of Mexico. Sand everywhere, a few little sponges and soft corals, and an artificial reef. This, this is on the Pegasus. Here's a great example of a lion's paw hanging out doing what he does right in between all the other other stuff. This is actually inside the Pegasus. You can see a long spined urchin over here and a, and a fairly, fairly juvenile lion's paw. He hasn't really developed too much growth yet. It's pretty, pretty easy to see. Let's see where I'm going. Okay. That was that was supposed to be earlier, so we're going to skip it. <laughs> this, is, this is the Roatan Express. This is a ship that sank back in 03 or 04. Let me, look, let me look at my notes right quick. And uh, this was a cargo ship that ran between Tampa and Roatan, an island off of Honduras, carried general cargo. And she was in calm seas and uh, took on a list to the starboard side in October of 92. And they don't know why, but the list worsened. Captain Coast Guard uh, radioed for Coast Guard, ordered an abandoned ship. Captain went back to the wheelhouse to relay coordinates one last time. A female passenger returned to her cabin to uh, retrieve her purse and the ship turtled. So the female passenger and the captain were never found and the rest of the crew was was rescued by Coast Guard and interestingly enough they had to make an emergency landing on Sanibel Beach uh, because the chopper ran out of fuel. So the, those poor people survived a shipwreck and a helicopter crash basically <laughs> in the same day. <laughs> And we don't, I don't go inside this ship anymore. We used to, because the captain's quarters used to be filled with booze. Uh, <laughs> vo vodka bottles, wine bottles, and Chivas Regal oh. bottles. So we, would, we would recover lots of bottles from inside the captain's quarters. I've never opened one. Uh, I've given them away as presents, and I kept one. I have one still in my collection that I keep in my display case. It it looks as though you could drink it. It looks like it's okay, but I'm not taking a chance. More, more of a talking piece. Uh, she's in 190 feet of water, 70 miles west of Fort Myers. This is a shot of the stern, that is the prop and the rudder, and she's pretty eerie because she's sitting perfectly upright on the floor of the Gulf of Mexico. And, it, and of all the shipwrecks I've dived on, this one is the most eerie. It looks like she is literally sailing across the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico. And there's a lifeboat off the starboard side in the sand, upside down. This is a shot of the crow's nest 
on the Rotan Express, nice school of amberjack. That one of the foregrounds, probably 80, 90 pounds. So it's a good size fish. This is typically hit by commercial fishermen on a pretty regular basis, even though it's pretty far offshore and it's deep, and it's not that deep for a commercial fishermen. <coughs> okay, so to wrap up, I've got just a few interesting photos. This is, a, this is what we call a shovel nose lobster, or a bulldozer, and not many people have ever seen them or know they exist. Their little legs look like candy canes, and they're a common find in the Gulf of Mexico, no season, no bag limit. They're just as, as delicious as a spiny lobster, and they're just really neat. This is a, this is a mass of oct octopus eggs, and this is the Bayronto. And they, they have all hatched. Every one of these eggs cap, egg capsules is open. And all the babies have, have been hatched. Uh, this is a nudibranch. Of course, it's a mollusk, as you know, with no shell. Doesn't need a shell. It has bright, vivid colors to indicate its toxicity to predators. And we have quite a few of those out in the Gulf of Mexico if you take your time to stop and look at the small things. This is a very large Atlantic stingray. Uh, it's difficult to convey size in photos, uh, but this stingray is approximately eight feet across from one wing to the other. And if I had to guess, it must weigh, it must weigh 250 to 300 pounds. It's the largest stingray I've ever seen. This is a shot from the phosphate pier at Boca Grande. Everybody knows the old phosphate pier the frequent haunt of tarpon. These are some spotted eagle rays at the Fort Myers boxcars. Uh, another, another common fish to see in the Gulf of Mexico. And they're just beautiful. And sometimes you'll see big schools of them. Dolphins, we don't see a lot of dolphins. They give us a wide berth for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, this, is, this is a mother with a, with a juvenile. Uh, it's a spotted dolphin, which is the most common species we see offshore. And for some reason, she came very close to me uh, several times on that dive and gave me a chance to get a clear shot. Doesn't usually happen, so I'm kind of proud of that photo. Of course, some sea turtles are very common. I have a sea turtle skull up here on the table. I'm not real good on species. I don't know if this is, I'm, I'm assuming it's a loggerhead. If someone knows better, let me, please let me know. It is. Thank you. Uh, we, have, we have the large Bahamian starfish here. Uh, see them on a pretty regular basis. And I believe they're protected these days. I don't think you can harvest those, so, so I do not. This is off of Venice Beach. It's a base gallop. You can see all his little eyes. I used to do a lot of diving off Venice Beach. I have a shark's tooth up here, and I have a large mammoth tooth that Ted already held. Feel free to pick it up and check it out. It's, it's pretty neat. And those are the kind of things you can find off, off of Venice Beach. This is a flounder off of Venice Beach. And I, I like this photo just because the, the camouflage is so perfect. And it's almost hard to see. Uh, you have to let your eyes adjust. And uh, very cool photo. This is a moon jelly with some type of fish inside the jelly. I don't know what they are. I've never tried to, to, to look that up. It's, a, it's common to see these small fish living in symbiosis with the moon jellies. Just, a, just an interesting shot. It's been about an hour, so I'm gonna wrap up. This is, a, this is a spiny lobster under a ledge. Again, common find in the Gulf of Mexico. Just an interesting shot with a little tropical fish up above his head. That's my last photo. So here we, uh, just just to show what attracts life in the Gulf of Mexico. Obviously, this is a, a ball of crab trap line that's a, in a big mass at the surface. That's a triple tail fish. Those are a popular catch right now. A lot of people catching triple tail on the stone crab traps. 
So it just goes to show what holds life in the Gulf of Mexico, absolutely anything, any type of structure. And that's, uh, that's my last photo. This is the phosphate <laughs> pier. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, it's a mangrove snapper and a large and a large goliath grouper just kind of checking me out while I was stone crabbing one day. Uh, as, as they, they were just as curious about me as I was about them. So that's, that's about my time for today. And thank you very much for having me. And I'd like to say uh, I always wondered if I could match what was in my grandmother's shell cabinet. And, and what eventually wound up happening was, I, obviously I found things that she could never dream or imagine of finding. And it was so amazing and so wonderful. <clears throat> Excuse me. For me to be able to go to her house on a Sunday and share with her all the things I found that she could only dream of was amazing. So thank you very much. We're gonna take a 15 minute break if you wanna come up. Oh, is there any questions? <laughs> Sorry. I can answer questions. Marty has one in the back. <laughs> Happy to answer questions. I have the day off. <laughs> Is it still on? Yep. One more thing, too. If any of you would like to have any of the photos I showed today, yes. if you could write your email address down for me, I'd be happy to share those with you. Yes, sir. Will you No, nope. Uh, like I said, we, we, see, we see sharks, but I, I, have, I have thousands of dives in the Gulf of Mexico with dead fish attached to my person. And very rarely do we have encounters with sharks. It happens, uh, but it's rare. And my th uh, I usually have buddies with me. We all have loaded spear guns. And you really have to have the mentality that you are the top of the food chain. You can't panic, and you and you have to know that uh, you can shoot a shark if you have to. And I've never had to, so that's good. But they have chased us back to a boat before, <laughs> and, and it's not that fun. <laughs> are there laws here in Florida governing what you can take off? Uh, the only laws I'm aware of, you, you, cannot, you cannot take man-made objects that are older than, don't quote me on this, there's a time limit, like 50 years. So I go hiking at a couple places here and find human artifacts from the Calusa Indians on a regular basis. You are not allowed to take those. It is against the law. But when it comes to shipwrecks in the Gulf of Mexico, it's the wild, wild west. <laughs> you can, you can port portholes, uh, uh, helms, bells. You are allowed to take anything you would like. As far as I know, I would check with law enforcement before going and doing something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, please. Yes. You put your hand underneath that shelf? You don't know what's in that shelf you put your hand Well, there. I dive with a very bright flashlight. <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, literally, it's equivalent to a European sports car headlight. It's extremely bright. It was very expensive. And uh, it's very dark on the bottom. I do not put my hands in places I can't see. I've seen guys do that. It typically ends poorly. <laughs> So I no, if I do use one of those little uh, grippers where it has the trigger yeah. with the pincher on the end, like for reaching something on a high shelf, I will use that for reaching deer calories and lion's paws I can't quite reach. Thank you. Yes. Like, do you have a, just like 
store, the shop. What do you do with all this stuff? <laughs> I have a very small shell cabinet, and what doesn't fit in there, uh, when I, my new theory is what doesn't fit, something must go. So when I find something nicer than I already have, the old one has to go. Where does it go? eBay. Martha? Because oh. <laughs> <laughs> as, as you all know, it gets out of control. What's, you your, what's your handle on eBay? Uh, Shell Diver 1465. <laughs> I haven't sold anything in a while. But. Maybe you do a shell dive. You eat a lot yeah. of fish. I eat a lot of fish. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Can you tell us what the lion's uh, paw is? species taste like? Oh, they're they're absolutely amazing. Compared to like a scallop? No. Uh, typically what I tell people that are on the boat is that they're poisonous. You should never eat them. <laughs> <laughs> they, they have a flavor that's really hard to describe and I do tell people this. Never eat a lion's paw because you will be ruined for life. You'll never eat scallops in a restaurant again. They actually have a flavor. They don't just taste like a squishy nothing. They're 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 incredible. Yeah. Okay. yeah they are they are delicious. I'm in. I'm going. <laughs> Come on over. I'll, I'll make you a batch. All right. Is that it? Okay. The stove, the fish This this is a black. This is a skull from a black grouper. This is a skull from a sea turtle. This, this, obviously I found this in this condition. I contacted the game warden and the keys, and he said I could, I could take this. I got permission. Uh, and this grouper I shot last year on Black Friday, uh, in about 130 feet of water, it's a 80 pound black grouper, and I spent the, I just finished it, I spent the past year uh, removing, the, removing the material and gluing it back together. Oh. It's, it's a, it took a lot of, lot of hours in that, <laughs> for sure. Can you tell us your uh, eBay handle? It is shell, it's all one, it's all one, all lowercase, shell diver 1465. Thank you. You're welcome. Cool. <laughs> all right, we'll take a quick break and come up here and take a look at his displays too during the break. Yeah. Thank you. 